Good morning. It's April 18th, 2020. Dr. Noel Williams up from Health Associates, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, didn't do an update last night. Too many things happened yesterday afternoon with the Oklahoma State Health Department, some other information. I just had to let it sit um, so I could paint a coherent picture today. I couldn't have done it last night because there was too many confusing data points. So current statistics about oh, 2.3, 2.4 million people in the world have it. About 160,000 deaths in the United States were 640,000 roughly. Again, I'm ballparking a little bit here because I just reviewed the numbers and they start to blur. About 133,000 uh, plus deaths. Some of the death stuff is a little confusing in the United States because some of the statistics from New York have gotten a little uh, hard to manage for them, and so we're, that's going to get cleaned up eventually. Oklahoma, uh, about 2,600 cases of 136 deaths as of yesterday. The Oklahoma numbers are particularly hard to understand because of the data recording. Um, I have a, we have a friend who I'm pretty convinced had it, had all the symptoms, and uh, took the Plaquenil, broke the cycle, and she's day 11 or 12 without getting her results, which we'll talk to, we'll talk about again, because this whole necessary step is testing, 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 which we've been talking about since um, really February and really, really, really importantly since March, and we just are not getting any of the testing done, but that's or in any kind of rational way, but that's not as much anyone's fault is just how it is because there's so little reagent. So let's talk first about some world stuff. So a lot of people have questioned the whole narrative about the Chinese uh, being involved either with manipulating the lab or manipulating the virus or covering up the viral uh, spread. I think the current trend of the data is th that it did come out of the Wuhan lab. There's a debate on whether it was manipulated or not manipulated, but it was definitely something they were studying. Because uh, if you look at the literature on, and go do a PubMed search and do SARS and antibodies, almost all that data is from the Wuhan lab or a huge proportion of it. So it just, you know, if, it, if you hear hoofbeats in Kentucky, you don't think zebras. And you really have to start thinking, you know, patterns matter. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, Luc Montier, uh, Dr. Luc Montier, who was the co-discoverer of, of the AIDS virus, HIV, um, won the Nobel Prize in 2008, yesterday uh, went out on a limb and said that there was gain of function on the virus. Um, and it was manipulated. He's probably one of the top two or three virology researchers in the world. I mean, he makes pretty much anyone else look at a lower scale. Um, and so here, just so you'll be able to see, that's, that's him. I'll post um, this whole thing shortly with some quotes from him. Uh, but this says, Nobel winning scientist who co-discovered HIV claims Nobel coronavirus was made in Wuhan's lab. He, of course, has immediately now, um, he made this comment yesterday, uh, later in the day, and so now he's a conspiratist after being one of the most highly regarded scientists in the entire world. <laughs> it's really funny. If you even question the narrative, you're a crackpot, okay? It's that simple because the Chinese government, whether it escaped the lab or or was made in the lab and escaped, doesn't want anyone to know that. And maybe we're all wrong anyway, and it, it didn't, but you know, it's really funny that the second anyone says it, even one of the most premier scientists in the world who knows more about virology, HIV, and all of it, specifically said the HIV molecule or genomic sequence is what they call a gain of function sequence, meaning it was manipulated by molecular tools to put it into the SARS virus because it couldn't have occurred spontaneously looking or the way he looks at the genome. So he's a world expert. You could ignore him or not. I'm just presenting the information. So there's that. And I think that whole um, narrative is going to go flesh itself out over the next uh, month or two. And just keep in mind when you have someone, one person from the Defense Department saying, oh, it's probably this anonymously. 
they were told to do that. And then all of a sudden, Mark Esper will walk it back a little and walk it forward. The number one thing with the Defense Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency is they never want anyone to know the truth about anything. And so there's always um, wheels within wheels about why the information is released and how it goes. So yes, maybe it's all false, but it's probably mo more likely to be true. Um, and again, look at who China put in charge of the response. It was a general, it's a girl. You look her up, find out her name and find out what her expertise was and think, why would, would they pick that person for a viral pandemic? I think the answer is pretty self-evident. And again, lots more data on that um, will be coming. Now, if we look at Oklahoma, well, I couldn't really talk last night because I was so flabbergasted by everything that had happened. So we had a great conference call with my, with the inner hospital, uh, Oklahoma City inner hospital group um, with multiple CEOs and chief medical officers from all the main hospitals in the entire Oklahoma City area with the Oklahoma Health Department yesterday that we'd set up that call. And I want to emphasize the Oklahoma Health Department people who were on that call were the nicest, most sincere, wonderful people we could have talked to who have a lot to do with the COVID response patterning, uh, testing, predictions. And so we started the call with, uh, give us a general background, what's going on, what's the update, was the first thing that was asked. And so they went through with some testing stuff that they um, have gotten rid of a form um, that the CDC required. Um, so that definitely is going to help them shave off, you know, some paperwork and help their efficiency. Um, then they talked a little bit just in general about state readiness. But then when we, when they were asked about surge data, which, and I specifically asked that question first, there, there was dead silence on the phone, which was confusing since that's their job. And they basically after you know and when you're in a zoom call with about 12 people when no one says anything for 30 seconds it's a long time so i asked again and one of them responded that you know they really didn't hadn't well the actual statement was they hadn't actually had time to look at that in the last week or so which which seemed a little surreal to me to completely was bum fuzzling i mean i mean so and then right after that, Larry Bookman, who's Oklahoma State Medical Association president, joined the call. He came in about 15 minutes later than the start time because he was doing a public service announcement, had just has been in contact with all these, the leadership in the state. And he caught the tail end of the fact that there was no, they couldn't give any surge data. Well, Dr. Bookman very elegantly explained that, well, he had just discussed this with the senior people at Oklahoma State Health Department and that the surge is predicted for April 30th. Again, very confusing with what the governor did um, <coughs> this week. And, but it was kind of surreal to have that happen where they can't tell the leadership teams of all the hospital systems what the actual surge is. Either, and I don't believe they didn't know. I think they probably were told not to tell us. Um, and then the state epidemiologist who was the lead, um, Aaron, Dr. Aaron, and I can't pronounce his last name, of course, um, was supposed to be on the call, but he got called away at the last minute, so he couldn't be there, which was interesting too. Um, and then at about 4.30, so we got our phone call ended about 3.15 or so, um, or a little, a little earlier, about 2.45. Um, at 4.30, the state health department did a press release to the hospitals that the surge date had actually already passed, and it was April 15th um, this past um, Tuesday. So, or 14th, something like that. So the whole thing, we went from, it's April 30th, April, well, April 21st, then all of a sudden it was April 30th. Um, it was April 30th. Our phone call, the epidemiologists, or excuse me, the state health department people couldn't say, really give us an answer. Then Dr. Bookman comes and says, no, the head of the state health department has said it's the 30th. And then at 4.30, they release, no, we already had it uh, three days ago. So it's very, very confusing with what's going on in our state with all of this shifting data. And so then to think, make things even more interesting in our state, um, Governor Stitt on Wednesday said we were gonna be allowed to do elective surgeries on the 26th. And I'm gonna go over why that's such a big deal. 
And then he just said elective surgeries. And keep in mind that he'd met with Secretary Lawfridge, Secretary Shrum, uh, Dr. Larry Bookman, leadership from uh, from Oklahoma Osteopathic Association, leadership from the, um, the Oklahoma Nurses Association, who had all uniformly agreed with him on approximately Tuesday that they would not make a decision on elective surgery um, in, for at least another week. And they were projecting May 1st to May 15th, but they didn't even know yet. And so that was the Tuesday meeting with the, the entities that on a state level that matter. And again, they're not communicating directly with CEOs or chief medical officers. They're totally out of the loop, totally out of the loop. So on Wednesday, when he's giving his news conference, he's supposed to say that and say, well, hopefully are going to open what we call elective surgeries, but only urgent elective, meaning people who've been waiting for cancer and, and have other big deals, but aren't true emergencies. And just out of the blue, he says, um, we're just opening elective surgery. And then on Thursday, uh, he comes out with these uh, these normograms of what actually you can do, in, and we're gonna do it in phases, which is different than what he said. And by Thursday evening, um, there was a joint letter or response from the Oklahoma State Medical Association, the Oklahoma Osteopathic Association, and the Oklahoma Nurses Association, three groups that really don't like each other um, at all <laughs> in many respects, because competition. Uh, do a joint press release saying they firmly stand against everything Governor Stitt has done. So Governor Stitt has managed to go against all medical advice from the experts in the state, his own secretaries of health, and from all the, the umbrella medical groups, and never even talked to any of the hospital administrators about it, like maybe you talk to um, the CEO of Integris. Um, maybe you talk to the CEO of the Mercy Systems. Get their opinions. Can they handle it? And the reason that this is the issue with elective surgeries, there's about seven days of PPE at the Integris system right now at current use. They can stay about with a leeway of about seven days. They get some in. They're using it up for their hospitalized COVID patients and other patients. If you add elective surgeries in right away, they're gonna go from a seven day to about a two day supply and within two days. And so they don't have any leeway if there's any bump up at all in terms of COVID patients. Um, plus the fact that a lot of these surgeries that potentially could be done, if the person is a, an asymptomatic COVID person, you have to have already done, done the testing the day or two before to prove they don't have it and certain people are gonna be in that gray zone where they wouldn't be positive, but they could be infected. So the whole thing becomes really hairy. It's for the hospitals. And that's why they're so concerned about opening too early on that. So the fact that the governor did all this is crazy. So then on Friday, he he has then leased Deaconess Hospital, it was then the follow-up to Friday. So he said, we're opening elective surgery, we're uh, then gonna change that slightly, and then on Friday, in a totally schizophrenic moment, but I am going to rent um, Deaconess in case there's a surge we can't handle and activate the Oklahoma National Guard Medical Corps to be ready to staff it. Because if that opens up as a state facility, it won't be staffed by um, people like me. Not that you want a gynecologist there, but by the same token, I can still function as a doctor. Uh, they're going to have this National Guard and Army Corps of Engineers take care of that. So that's a wonderful thing from the federal government and the Oklahoma National Guard. And I, again, the Oklahoma National Guard leadership is the bomb. Um, I mean, I, they're, the Oklahoma National Guard people are a 10. So we have the right support people in place. It's just kind of crazy that we don't believe that Governor Stitt thinks, oh, well, we can just open up everything, which is what he keeps on saying, essentially. And then, oh no, but I'm gonna get a hospital ready just in case there is a surge, which is definitely not making sense unless you're thinking, well, maybe when I open up the, the um, state, if there's a pulse of cases, we're ready for it, but the whole thing would be to avoid it. And it, But again, I totally understand wanting to open up the state. All of us in medicine, independent practices, and then surgeons, and then you go from medicine to hairstylists, to schools, to engineers, to whatever 
job category you're in, this closure is killing people in terms of financially. But again, it's still about saving lives and trying to do it in a rational way, in a prepared way. So very confusing on the state level. I don't think there's going to be any hope that it's going to become unconfusing. I do think, though, that the medical system is very geared up to handle it. Um, and in many respects, um, I think, everything we've done's worked, the numbers are coming down, and that then makes the naysayers go, well, you were wrong. Well, no, the interventions worked, so I think we want to be happy about that. And just on a final note, uh, the interplay between Como and Trump is actually fairly uh, hilarious. Um, Como definitely run, won the latest round with Trump criticizing him and then Como for <coughs> saying they needed all this stuff, and now they're not needing it. And Como's like, we followed the federal government projections. I mean, so you're, when Trump is criticizing Como for that, he was following what they told him. So it makes no sense. <coughs> anyway, that's just allergies for me. So lots of interesting things. Have a wonderful day. Um, I plan on doing one on Sunday night. So take care. <laughs>